administrator for IRB here at Baylor. So, Tiffany, okay. take it away. And if this computer decides to freeze, just bear with me. It's like a really, really old dinosaur computer. So. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to go over just some general IRB information, um, especially uh, I'm going to talk about the issue of consent. I know it's one thing Mark had mentioned. Um, and also just some general information about approval criteria, what the IRB looks for when they approve a protocol. Um, I also included a few slides um, with the kind of questions that kind of, I guess, are most asked most often. So I included those two, you know, just in case they're useful. Okay. Okay, so what does it take to get the study started? Um, to submit a protocol in BRAIN, anyone can start a draft protocol um, and actually, you know, work with it and get it set up. But as far as actually submitting, it has to be faculty to submit. Um, or um, if it's uh, someone who's maybe voluntary faculty, they have to be research certified, and that's something they do for our office to be able to uh, submit protocols. We do have two different types of review for the IRB. Um, I'll go over that a little bit, too. Um, great. We have expedited review, which um, that's our reviews, our protocols that come in that are more like your chart reviews, basically minimal risk stuff. Um, lots of chart reviews, um, maybe simple blood draws, things like that. And we also, of course, have our full board review or convened IRB review for um, the greater than minimal risk studies, drug studies, device studies, basically anything that can't be reviewed according to the expedited procedure. We do still do exemptions. We used to have more than one category. Um, I think it was about a year ago. We changed to only have one category of exemption. It's not very often used. Um, it's really for kind of special demonstration products that are federally funded, so we don't see them very often. And of course, we do get a bunch of protocols that come in where we may end up making the ter determination that it doesn't need IRB review. Go ahead. When you say faculty, does that include residents, or does it have to be like a professor or assistant professor? Professor or assistant professor. Okay. Um, I'm not positive about the instructor. Like if it's just instructor status, that I can't remember. But and does it have to be the PI, or can it be somebody who just like is okay with their project? <laughs> no, I mean it can, it can be like if you know, kind of like you said, if they're maybe they'll just be the PI for you, you know, like in brain. I mean, you can because I'm sure that happens a lot, um, like with you know, pieces of projects and stuff like that. I mean, but they'll they'll be listed as the PI in there, even if it's you know, basically like your study. So human subjects research. Um, this is just the, the definition we go by of what constitutes human subjects research. Um, the identifiable private information, that's the reason why you know, we do have to review chart reviews as human subjects research. And of course, if we get data through intervention or interaction with individuals, also makes it human subjects research. Sorry, I'm freezing up again here. <laughs> Poor guys. Okay, as far as the definition of research, um, basically it's systematic investigation, um, testing, um, and I also I want to point out especially the, the contributing to generalizable knowledge. Um, it can be kind of a gray area, um, especially for us on the IRB side, between um, quality assurance projects and research. Um, and this definition is kind of what makes it tricky sometimes. Um, but we do get a lot of quality assurance projects that come in. Some really don't end up needing IRB review because they're truly not research. Maybe it's just a, you know, some sort of project to kind of improve something within a department. But many times they come in and it ends up being more truly as a research project. You know, they want to generalize outside the college, maybe, you know, help other institutions, you know, develop the same type of program. So like quality improvement, would that count as research then? I think what it, what it really comes down to is the intent. Um, you know, because if it's truly a, a quality improvement where maybe, you know, you want to look at something in your department, improve something, I guess you'd say locally, then it really wouldn't be research. It kind of just depends on, especially what, you know, what the investigator's telling us the intent is, you know, versus, you know, because it may be quality, quality improvement, you know, and they say, well, there's a chance maybe we want to um, publish later, but that in itself wouldn't necessarily make it research. It kind of just depends on what the, I guess, what the intent is. So. Really, the more the investigator tells us, you know, in protocol submissions and the purpose, the purpose of the protocol, you know, the easier it is for us to review. Um, these are just some, I guess, most common types of protocols that we have come in. Um, we do have some kind of strange ones or ones that don't necessarily fit in any of these type of um, categories. Um, just to give you an example, uh, over at the VA, we do have a cooking vaccine study, which those are kind of, they're very different and 
kind of interesting to you know hear the reviews done at the meeting. Um, but these are probably the most common interview studies, questionnaires. Um, but it's not on here, but focus groups, uh, chart reviews. The chart reviews are probably the bulk of our expedited protocols that come in. Um, those are uh, reviewed by the IRB staff. Um, database queries, of course, our clinical trials, um, comparisons of new treatments. And of course, we, we use brain for everything. Um, it basically captures the life of the protocol. Everything's done through brain now. Um, you're drafting your protocol, submission, any correspondence with the IRB back and forth, everything's captured in brain, the entire history of the protocol. And it, it mentions city training on here, and I actually have a slide later on um, with some information about city, because that's something that comes up a lot. It seems like we get a lot of calls about who has to do the city training for human subjects research, and um, you know what, what do they have to do once they log into the city. Of course, the, the common rule, um, here at Baylor, at least right now, we apply it to everything we review. So we don't just apply it to you know, only our federally funded research. We apply the common rule to any, every type of study that comes into us. Um, we do have some additional protections for vulnerable populations. Um, and also on the IRB side, um, whenever it's a study that involves, especially prisoners, um, just because sometimes that can involve some special permissions that we have to get on the IRB side, um, and with children and pregnant women, there's some special findings that we have to make on the IRB side. Um, and we get those findings and review those findings based on what the, um, the investigator submits to us in the protocol. And just some general areas to go to for guidance. My personal opinion, I think the FDA's <coughs> FAQs are a little bit harder to navigate, at least for me. Um, but I think OHRP has really, really good, um, easy to navigate um, FAQ sections and just they have you know different questions that people have submitted for those weird situations that come up and it's just very very useful. And again, um, to submit the protocol, anyone can get a protocol started, um, even like an administrative coordinator, but it does have to be faculty to submit the protocol. Once they submit the protocol, um, it goes automatically to I guess the queue of the department chairs. Um, or, you know, if they've designated to somebody to maybe sign for them, it goes to them for signatures first, and then once once those people have signed off, it immediately goes to us. It goes into our queue. And we do have six boards. Um, there's a note on here about VA research because it's pretty recent. Starting in August of 2012, all VA protocols go to one board. Um, it was to... I guess kind of make it easier to make sure, because VA, they have some special requirements that are on top of what we review for the other types of protocols. And so it was easier just to kind of contain them to one board, because um, the requirements are a little bit different. Um, the IRB staff, there's uh, seven analysts now, and then myself in the IRB office. We're kind of the, I guess, the first line to look at the protocols, first set of eyes to look at them. Um, and the first thing they do, um, we do, is look at the protocol and decide which ones have to go to the convene IRB. So they're usually, you know, your greater than minimal risk studies, or you know, maybe just a study that for whatever reason doesn't meet the criteria for us to be able to review ourselves. And also look for um, which protocols we can just review ourselves. They don't have to go to the board. It's more of like an administrative um, type review in house. Just to give you an idea as far as what the protocol numbers are, I think for the total. All protocols last year, it was a little over 5,000. I think it was 5,033 or, or something like that. Um, what percentage of those are expedited? So just reviewed by the IRB staff, a big chunk of them, as you can imagine. Um, each of the analysts, they probably get between 100 to 120 a month. So yeah, I was stay pretty busy in the office. <laughs> um, and the, the seven to 10 days here at the end, uh, that's usually the time frame that we give to investigators for when they can expect a response from the IRB. Um, they're, when the protocols come in, they're automatically tagged to a meeting date. Now, even if it's a protocol that doesn't have to go to the full board, um, it still receives a, it's still tagged to a meeting date. It's for tracking purposes. Um, and it, there, with those, we try to, I guess, review the expedited um, a little bit quicker. Like there's a chance it may not even take until the meeting date for the investigator to actually get a response. But you know, depending on workload and everything else, 
um, we definitely want to keep it to where the investigator is not waiting more than seven to ten days after that meeting to get a response. And for the expedited review, again, it's um, uh, the IRB staff typically who are reviewing those protocols. I would say the bulk of them are chart reviews uh, most of the time. Some of them are MRI studies, um, simple blood draws, um, things like that. We also have an expedited category for um, studies which may, they may be or have started as uh, greater than minimal risk, but they're at a point in the research where they're only doing data analysis or very, you know, a very few limited activities. Um, and that's one, an expedited category that we do have as well. There's a chance um, that some of the expedited protocols may be a little tricky. Like maybe we just need like maybe someone else's expertise, um, especially with some of the registry studies, the um, data registries, or maybe you know sample biorepositories. Sometimes those can be a little bit tricky, so we'll have um, an additional board member help review those. For the full board review, we use the team reviewer system. So basically, what that means is the the new protocols that come in have to be the full board. They're usually reviewed by about three or four people. Um, I would say probably four on average. Um, everything, they're assigned everything before the meeting about a week so that they have enough time to look over everything, um, review all the materials that go with the protocol, and basically kind of get their feedback and um, their view on the protocol ready by the time um, they go to the meeting. And of course, there's discussion, deliberations, um, votes at the IRB meeting. Um, and the IRB staff, uh, they're really, this is where they're doing a lot of work too. You know, they're making sure, because we have to make sure we have a certain number of people there at the meeting. They're documenting who comes in, you know, who leaves the room, who comes back in, things like that. And again, we want to make sure that um, we always aim to um, have the investigator receive the response from the IRB within seven to 10 days. Sometimes it's faster, just depending on workflow. Um, we definitely don't want to wait any longer than that. Now, what are the, um, our, what do we look for when we're reviewing a protocol? And these are kind of the, I guess the, I'll call them like the day seven general approval criteria. Now within these, there's going to be some more specific stuff, you know, that I didn't include on here, such as, you know, for drug studies, you know, we need to have the ID number and things like that. But these are the general approval criteria. So of course they're looking to see that risk to subjects are minimized. Um, and these approval criteria, they're the same for expedited protocols. they're looking at um, what benefits are expected, um, is the risk worth it, and also the selection of subjects, you know, they're looking to see, make sure, you know, no, maybe one group of subjects is left out unnecessarily, you know, maybe there's not really a, you know, valid scientific reason to leave them out. And of course we have um, many board members that have experience with vulnerable populations, especially children, so it's a big portion of our um, greater than minimal risk studies are uh, pediatric protocols. And the, I guess I should call it the issue of informed consent, um, whether it be, you know, a study where the, sub, you know, the, the investigator is obtaining consent from subjects or, you know, in the case of like an expedited protocol, maybe where the investigator is requesting a waiver of consent. And of course there's a lot of things underneath informed consent. This is kind of just a, a snapshot of them. Uh, but I would guess overall I would say is it understandable to the subject when they look at the consent form? Is it clear what's going to happen, why it's happening, um, their options, things like that. And of course we always tell investigators aim for seventh grade language. It's not always possible but that's usually what we, we state the goal is. Of course we may have protocols where their um, the investigator wants to obtain consent from legally authorized representatives. That does happen, and again, I would I would kind of group that under our vulnerable populations. <coughs> and adequate provisions for data safety monitoring. <coughs> I guess it's fairly new within the last couple of years. We actually have a separate form that because that is actually attached to PDF attached to the protocol, and it's basically it's questions all about data safety monitoring. Um, our goal eventually is to get that form kind of hard coded in brain so it's not something where the investigator has to complete and then attach. It's on the list, we just haven't gotten there yet, but that'll make it a little bit easier. But that actually makes for an easier review because then all the information is there together. And of course, looking at um, privacy, security of data, um, 
the IRB staff and myself, we, we especially try to help out in this area, uh, mostly because we're usually given reminders every so often by IT security, you know, kind of what to look for, um, make sure if protocols come in, you know, if they're, you know, if they're using a laptop, you know, make sure to tell them, you know, see IT security, make sure it's encrypted, things like that. So we're usually keeping an eye on that to try to help. Again, looking at um, either vulnerable populations or, I mean, really it could just be in general, uh, making sure that it doesn't seem like there's any coercion. Um, and really as far as what protections we're looking for, uh, kind of just depends on the protocol. I would say probably the most common one here, prisoners, we don't see a whole lot of prisoner research. Maybe a few every year, maybe a handful or so. Um, I would say probably out of this group, uh, the majority would be children. Now what can the IRB decide? Um, I should note here that when it's, when, it's, when it's an expedited review, so it's just the IRB staff looking at it, um, it can be approved or it can be approved with modifications. Those are the two options. Now of course it can be approved with modifications, that means it goes back and forth between the IRB staff and the investigator for however many times it takes. Um, but these tabled and disapproved options, um, that's for the convened IRB reviews. Tabled is used more when it's um, bigger issues, you know, maybe it's, you know, justifying a placebo arm or, you know, your your issues to basically where if the protocol came back, you know, it would need more than just the IRB staff looking at it. Your approval of modifications is going to be where maybe the IRB is requesting more directives, you know, please answer yes here or move this here, or, you know, basically minor things that need to be changed. Your disapproved uh, doesn't happen very often. I would, if I had to guess, I'd probably say maybe a few times a year, if even that. Um, that's going to be your your research to where basically even if you know the IRB sent the protocol back with a laundry list of changes, no matter what they did, it still couldn't be approvable. Um, so it's really, really, really usually big issues like maybe legal issues or something like that. And this is just kind of a snapshot showing the the convened IRB process. Um, if you want to, I know I don't have printouts today, but I can. I can also email to Mark like if you guys wanted to especially have this. It just kind of explains on the whole process for getting the protocol to the meeting and then basically what happens after the meeting. I just want to note for um, where it says table here, uh, the table, whenever a protocol is tabled at the meeting, it means that it will have to come back before the convened meeting again. Um, obviously, the sooner the investigator gets the response in, the sooner you know we can get it back to the meeting, but it does have to be the full board to look at it again since it was bigger issues that need to be fixed. <clears throat> it's possible uh, there may be some additional institutional requirements. I wouldn't say that um, happens very often. Um, if we do, uh, just to note, if we do, if the IRB disapproves something, there's not another part of the college that could approve it and override it. Does that mean, are you talking about for when you have to get like another IRB from another institution? Yeah, for or example, um, I guess like you could you could say Harris Health Systems. I'm not totally familiar with what the process actually looks like, but I know that uh, you do have to go through kind of like an administrative submission for them. I think they actually have like um, an electronic system they use now, so maybe permissions like that, uh, or maybe if it's um, like okay, if it's if it's VA research, you know they have to go through. There's there's a few extra steps there. You know, the investigator aside from getting IRB approval will also have to go through like their research and development committee. Um, things like that, so kind of just depending on where exactly you're going to do the research. So, so research, let's like, say at Ben Tom, you have to get at Harris Health and that sort of semi IRB thing as well as a. Yeah, I'm not like, sure. See, I don't know what they ask in the the submission. I think it's probably pretty abbreviated. Um, you know, especially if the investigator already has their IRB approval. I think it's more just um, for them, kind of like a notification. You know, that hey, this is the protocol we're doing. Um, I know they also have their own system for stamping, like a Spanish consent form. They have like their own Harris Health, the one called Harris County Hospitals, your Harris Health System stamp that they'll put on there. So, yeah, I haven't been able to look at what the system looks like, but I think it's, it's pretty quick. I don't think it's real time consuming or anything. <coughs> now, for continuing review or um, what we call on the IRB side, the renewals, typically the, re the renewal periods we give are a year. Um, I would say the majority of the time, that's how long we're renewing them for. Uh, we do have the option to um, 
maybe give a time period that's less than that if we feel like the IRB feels like it's a particularly risky protocol. For example, maybe the board would want to see it back in six months or, you know, if they want to see it, maybe come back, um, you know, after two subjects have been rolled or something like that. So that, that's always an option. Um, the consent in brain, of course, it's stamped of course automatically, which is nice with the approval dates and the last time um, the study was amended. This is kind of a, I guess, a, a catch or an aid for investigators just to make sure that they're using the most current version of the consent form. And of course, the the renewal needs to come in. Sometimes the renewals may come in the day before they expire, so they need to come in um, earlier than that just to make sure we give enough time for the IRB to review it. Because of course, if the protocol lapses, the approval lapses, any research that's going on right then does have to stop, which can be kind of tricky if it's a greater than minimal risk study and you have you know subjects on study drug and things like that. So basically, tell them you know the notices from brain start going out. I think it's 90 days before the protocol lapses. The sooner you get it in, the better. I included this slide um, just because th this seems to be a very common question, um, especially since um, I guess maybe it's been about two years since we started using city training, but it's a very common question, who has to do city training? Usually what I tell people, if you're working on a protocol, take the city training. You know, even if it's, you know, maybe you're not going to interact with subjects directly, you know, but if you're maybe handling, you know, study data or, you know, maybe even samples for that study, then I would say, um, take the city training. We did used to use the ECAT and BRAIN. Um, I think it's been long enough now to where basically uh, they've all expired now. So I think it's now we're moving everybody over to city. Um, BRAIN is not connected to city in that if, you know, even if the principal investigator, if they don't have their city training completed, there's not, there's not really a catch for BRAIN where it won't let them just submit. Um, so basically it is the responsibility of the, the um, principal investigator to make sure um, that they themselves have the city training and then anyone else working on the study has the training as well. It is something that we'll check for too whenever IRB does their routine monitoring, which is kind of like the, the random monitoring of different protocols. Case reports. And I included this just because I, I think it's good information to get out since um, it's fairly new uh, within the last year. Uh, prior to the last year, we, we were instructing <coughs> investigators to submit any case reports to us. Now, of course, the majority of the time the case reports were coming into us, we would look at them and say, you know, this really isn't research, and give them a letter basically saying, you know, hey, it's not human subjects research, you don't have to do anything further. But we wanted to make it to where it was a little bit easier, um, actually for both sides, and give some more directive information as far as what really needs to come to the IRB and what doesn't. So basically, this is what we um, came up with. And again, this is the wording that's now in our manual. Um, if it's three or fewer patients, we look at it as not research. So basically, it doesn't have to come to us. I mean, if it's something where the investigator, for whatever reason, needs something from the IRB, it's, it's of course, fine to go ahead and submit and get a letter from us. But otherwise, they don't need to submit to us. Um, if it's more than three patients, like maybe it's five, we would look at it as research. Um, and we'd probably just review it kind of like as a small chart review. <coughs> Included this one because it seems to be, um, I guess, a common confusion. Um, majority of the time, with your expedited protocols, you know, or maybe the, the PI, it's not really clear. You know, are they getting consent from subjects? Or are they wanting to waive consent? I think it's also just the layout of brain. The sections for waiver of consent and then waiver of documentation of consent are right underneath each other, and so sometimes <coughs> I think that causes some confusion whenever the the IRB and investigator are going back and forth. Um, of course, with the waiver of consent, say the most common example, chart abuse. That's usually what the investigator is requesting. The waiver of documentation of consent, they're still getting consent, just not documenting with our usual, you know, long consent form. Um, I would say probably surveys are the most common. You know, they may uh, may either be just you know kind of giving subjects the information orally or giving them a cover page. But basically, by you know completing the questionnaire or the survey or whatever it is, that's how they're consenting. So the investigator doesn't have to actually document it. And when they can use the, um, the investigator can use waiver of documentation of consent, there are two different situations. Um, I would say this first one here, where the consent form is the only, I guess the only link between the subject and the research, um, 
this may be particularly important to the investigator, maybe if it's um, HIV-related research um, and it's a questionnaire, um, they may, you know, that may be a really good reason why they want to request that. Um, the second one here is probably the most common one. Um, the investigator may request it for um, focus groups, you know, maybe a focus group where they're not really even collecting information about, you know, about the people. They're just, you know, by them participating, they would be consenting. Um, and questionnaires, surveys, um, usually not not the not too intrusive surveys and questionnaires. For the waiver of consent, um, of course, I would say the most probably the most common example for when an investigator is using this is the chart review. You know, especially you know looking at you know old data. Um, for this third option here, uh, or the third item that must be met. Um, I guess I just kind of want to point out, I think sometimes it can be, I notice the protocols will come in and um, usually it's the investigators explaining why they can't get consent from the subjects, like maybe the, I don't know, the subjects are, you know, kind of lost a follow-up or, you know, they're not really sure how to locate some of them. But what the IRBs also really need to know is how does that affect the research? You know, so if we, you know, if, if they were required to get consent from all these people, you know, it's a chart review, some of the data is 10 years old, um, would it make it to where their, their data wouldn't be useful, you know, with the research, would they really not be even able to conduct the study at all? So that's really what the IRB is looking for. We usually kind of get half the answer. We usually kind of just have to prompt for, you know, what does that mean for your research? You know, if you did have to get consent, you know, how would that affect it? Could you even do the research? Is it would be too much work a legitimate reason? <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> But I think it kind of goes along with, you know, not being, you know, especially like subjects, you know, if the data is 10 years old, not, not being able to locate subjects, um, maybe even um, possibly feeling like it's intrusive to subjects. I mean, sometimes that can be a reason. It's just that, that further step of like, you know, what does that mean for the study? Does that mean, you know, you would have, you know, you wouldn't be able to use data from, you know, 90% of who you want to collect data from, you know. Basically, I tell them the more you give us, you know, the better. Here's some other resources. Um, our RCS folks, they do um, different workshops. I think they actually have one maybe next week, but they do an informed consent workshop that's a couple hours. Um, that's kind of fun. Um, they try to make it funny and kind of lively. Um, and we also do the, the creed sessions, which are once a month usually. I think it's the, the third Thursday of the month. Um, they try to just get like a variety of speakers. I know I have a couple presentations that I do for them. Um, and usually we get people from all over the college. What was, I'm sorry, what was that thing you said was the last Thursday? Oh, the, the CREED sessions? The what? Session? I can't remember what it stands for. I know that the acronym is CREED. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's basically, it's like the continuing education um, session. They're usually about an hour from, from um, I think they start it from noon to one, um, once a month on Thursdays. Um, but the, the RCS folks, they're in charge of those, you know, so be, they send out the notice and um, they try to just get like a variety of speakers. Um, basically, it's whatever whatever they feel like people around the college are requesting, you know, whether it's, you know, IT security to come give a presentation. Um, the privacy officer gives one too that's, that's, that's really helpful, all about HIPAA and everything and how HIPAA affects research and things like that. If we were able to make it to those workshops, like where would we find those materials? Because I think the privacy thing would probably be of yeah. interest to a lot of people. I know some of them, like I want to say some of them are available online, but I know not all of them are. Um, yeah, I mean it could be too where, um, I guess you can always email them too. I know they, I don't think they upload them like on the internet or anything, but they do have a copy, you know, just like if, just like if you want the slides or something. I think there was an IRB guideline on the internet, but it's like more than 100 pages. <laughs> Oh, our, our, our human, our, I have yeah, to get out and have it called our RV manual, our human research protections manual. Yeah, it's, it's pretty like that's pretty hard one. How do you contact um, these research compliance services? Is that all, does that link like on the internet? Um, I'm pretty sure, I think it's, it's. I'm sure it's, you know, whenever you're like in that section, I know it's under Office of Research. I think that usually that last option on the right is contact us. I can also just give you their names because it's okay. really two ladies, two ladies that are in there. But it's Lisa Green and Brandy Duke, and they're the um, they're the human side, you know, the human side uh, research compliance. If we had questions, will we be able to like potentially just email them, like friendly sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Page. <laughs> um, 
Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I know the, the manuals. Yeah, it's it's a lot of pages, and we do have um, underneath the you know the, when you go to administrative offices, offices of office of research has their own section. We do have kind of like a really abbreviated um, kind of like common issue guidance, um, but really those are you know it's just kind of like a handful of items you know from from that manual. But yeah, definitely you can always just email questions, and we do have a couple of. Um, I guess you just call them FAQ documents that are on there now too. Uh, we try to just kind of collect questions over a period of time that were the most common. Um, one of the sets of questions is really just kind of tailored to brain, more technical stuff, how to work brain and everything else. Uh, but the other ones are uh, more in-depth questions and protocol questions, and so that those might help too. And that's on the Office of Research website. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we do have the um, underneath the Office of Research too. We also have the the list of all the IRB meeting dates. It'll also give you the, the deadlines for when a study is submitted, you know, what what board, you know, what media date it's going to go to, and then also who your contact person would be. So basically the, the IRB staff analyst that's assigned to that board. And we do have um, a list of available um, short form foreign language documents. Um, we update those as we get new ones uh, more and more often. I want to say we just added Turkish pretty recently, so we're trying to get our collection of it. <laughs> is a short consent document? I'm sorry, what is that? Uh, basically, for, for um, foreign language speakers, we basically have like our, our two ways to document consent. We have the you know full length, and I'm just going to use Spanish because that's really that's, that's the most common here. The full length Spanish form, um, and also if you know if an investigator is doing research at Harris Health System. I'll tell you that they do require that full translated Spanish consent form. Um, so that's one way to document um, consent of um, Spanish speakers or you know, if there's another language that you're using. Um, short form is a little bit different. Um, it's the short form itself doesn't have the same information that, that you know that long translated form would, but it's because you employ the, the use of a translator. And so it's a little bit a little bit different um, system. I would say that's probably most commonly used. Um, as far as you know, when the IRB feels it's appropriate, it kind of just depends on the study. If it's a really, really complicated study, like maybe one of our human gene transfer studies, it may not be one where the board says, you know, you may, you know, you might, you might want to have the fully translated form just because it's so complicated and everything else. Um, but that is an option. And those are like the short consent. Is that sort of like generally applicable to any sort of IRB consent? Is that it, it basically has kind of. Um, very basic information, like the, the actual short form itself, which is the one that the subject signs, um, kind of has like the contact information for the PI. Basically, sort of explains for them that they're, you know, that this is a research study, but doesn't give the, the specific information that the fully translated form would get. And that's where your translator, you know, comes in handy. You know, using that, you know, your full length English one, kind of as a, I guess, a summary to be able to explain to the subject all the procedures and everything. I would say it's used pretty often, though. Just I know for Harris Health Systems, they're they're very particular, um, and usually I know that's something we usually try to give investigators a heads up about because it'll just be a pain for them later because they do require the, the full translated Spanish consent form, and we don't offer that. I know I have I have calls every so often asking if the IRB office if we do any translations, but we don't. So it's really up to the investigator to. Um, it doesn't have to be a service; it could be somebody that's just fluent in that language who can translate for them. We do have some reviewers on the IRB, you know, on the IRB side that will be able to at least review it and you know make sure that's understandable. Mm -hmm. um, is that consent form applied to any research outside of the medical field, or like is that only is that only for like Harris County hospitals or any Baylor research? No, oh, any Baylor research. Yeah, okay, you so need like the, the short always, form method versus right. the the long one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I it's just Harris. Like what you need by like so we don't create our own consent form. We use the IRB consent. <laughs> if you're not doing research at Harris Health, um, you really can. I mean, I would say probably the majority of the time the short form method is used probably because it's, um, I would say, a barrier to the to getting the form translated is cost. I mean, that's probably part of it. Um, I would say probably that's probably the most commonly method used, I, I think, as long as it's not, you know, at Harris Health System, but like Texas Children's. That's probably used most of the time. And I think they, because they also have, um, I don't know what you call it, but I think it's the translator line, I guess, that they kind of help with that too. So I think that's it's used there probably most of the time. Do you have other questions? Yeah. 
it's fully. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have a question. Again. That's okay. <laughs> so if we like aren't we haven't seen what these final IRB um, submissions look like. Is there a place that we can get started with like here's a sample successful IRB submission just so we like know the format and generally the kind of language you guys are looking for? I would think probably as far as like a starting point, your best bet is um, okay. We call it we call it dummy protocol, but just a draft protocol opening it to look at the sections because um, I mean that really kind of helps you know get kind of, you know, used to all the different sections. Um, I know, I remember one of the questions was, what do we look for, you know, in each of the sections of the protocol? It kind of just depends on the study. I mean, if you have, honestly, if you have a chart review, some of the sections in our, um, you know, our protocol template, they're not going to apply, um, you know, because they may be, you know, geared towards, you know, a device study or a drug study, things like that. Um, I know, so it's kind of hard to give like too, too specific of um, instructions as far as what to put in there. Um, I would say some of the sections that will apply no matter what, no matter what kind of study it is, always your procedures, um, your sample size. Even if it's just, you know, you're wondering, do I even really need an IRB review? I'm just looking at 30 samples. We're still going to ask you that anyway. So I would say sample size applies, procedures, um, risk section, um, uh, there's a section, um, I think, believe section K of the protocol, but it's security of data. You know, we do need to know that. You know, where are you keeping your data? You know, how are you securing it? Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to give it too specific because I know it kind of depends on, you know, what, what what kind of study it is. But that's probably your best starting point, I think, is just getting used to the, the different sections. Um, we don't have a template online or anything as far as, you know, this is a, you know, an improved protocol. I don't think we have an example like that. Probably just ask the PI that you're interested in working with about their previous proposals. Mm -hmm. uh, if we want to do a project with the intention of making like a student poster <coughs> but not publishing it, do we have to get an IRB? Oh, okay, so that, that must have been a question about the, the poster contest. I was trying to figure out what the poster <laughs> contest. So a student project, um, I guess it comes down to um, I guess the intent, like is the intent to really kind of carry out like a, like you would, like an actual research hypothesis and, I mean I say if that's, if that's the intent, even if you're not going to, even if you're not going to publish, I would say some it's a protocol. So does that then fall in the same kind of guidelines of like a pilot project, like for, yeah. so pilots you should get an IRB for? Mm hmm and again it really, you know, it, it, at least to me it comes down to the intent of the activity, you know, it may be, you know, if it's really truly just a department, um, maybe just trying to improve one of their processes that they do, you know, it's truly, truly quality improvement, you know, then, you know, that's different than, you know, what, you know, a pilot project, you know, still being researched. So, yeah, I would say submit, yeah. It can be tricky, honestly. That's, to me, that's, I think that's a pretty tricky area as far as kind of the quality improvement, maybe pilot type projects, and then, you know, the research. It can be kind of tricky. Or if you're in doubt, best bet, call us. You can always call us even before you put anything in brain. It's okay. You can email us or call us and we can always try to, you know, we'll probably ask you a ton of questions, but, you know, it, it may help in the long run, so. Great. Well, that's it. Thank you so much. Sure. Right. Sure.